I can coach the first quarter of an NFL game. Call Shit, some plays at the time. I can coach the first quarter of an NFL game. <laughs> I definitely Call the state championship defense. Oh, Lord, here he go. Cover one, Did you? two, mm -hmm. and three. When was this? Got my ring, 2000, what's it, 23, so 19? Yeah. Yeah, the you entire school. season? 2000, no, it was 20 because it was a COVID year. Okay. When COVID started during the, right before the season. We got our asses beat out here in Tempe. Mm. 2005, Nebraska slaughtered us because Coach Spurrier couldn't adjust to zero, the overload. They said Spurrier in Washington would just like, if it, because they didn't have an indoor. So yeah. if it rained, he would just send people home. <laughs> he or did he, that at UF. Yeah, or he would leave early and, and go golf. Like it was just, it was just the way he moved. Oh, but, guys, look like there's a cloud coming in. Huh? Guys, tea time. <laughs> He'd be out of there. <laughs> well, we see, don't practice. Spurrier didn't know how to pivot, but we will. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, when I'm feeling, get me up. Uh, on the mission, get me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, when I'm feeling, get me up. Uh, on the mission, get me up. Uh, Welcome. Mina Kimes. Wow. To the pivot. We are, I don't know if we've ever had this much excitement leading up to a show and also this much studying done, right? So everybody wanted to make sure that we were our smartest selves for this show. We got Freddie T, Channing, you're gonna cross your legs. She you know what's legs. She got her legs crossed. I can't, my pants too tight. <laughs> well, now I'm self conscious about it. <laughs> I'm gonna change it up. <laughs> And I, I'm RC. Guys, welcome to The Pivot. Thank you so much for all your support. Uh, it's Happy Dad. We appreciate all your sponsorship. Thank you for taking care of us. Uh, we're excited. And like I said earlier, this is, for us, a show where I get to show someone who my friend is. And, you know, we were talking about you early on today, and Fred was saying, like, I saw you guys give her her flowers and you know, she is super dope. And he was just kind of talking about the way you communicate the game. And I was saying, I was like, I think at first people thought we just did it. You know, I was like, but when you get around her, like, I'm going to be real. The only woman I text on game day about, hey, what about this matchup? Or did you see this play? Or I'm watching film is you. And you always have something to say that adds to the conversation. But you know, and a military brat, father was in the, the Air Force, okay. uh, met your mother in South Korea when he was stationed there, but you are a daddy's girl. <laughs> yeah. And, and so much about who you are, like when I hang around you and people ask me about you, I was like, nah, you can kind of say whatever you want around me. <laughs> I was like, she's a guy's girl. But talk a little bit about the relationship between you and your father and how his love for Seattle sports also spurred your love for sports as well. So my first, it's funny you were talking about it, my first love was actually not Seahawks football, but Nebraska football. <laughs> I was born in Alfred Air Force Base in Nebraska. And wow. my earliest memories watching football with my dad were watching Tommy Frazier, mm -hmm. who was my favorite. That's probably why I love option football. So in these like, you know, running quarterbacks now. I liked it because he liked it. I also liked it because it was complicated. It's the most complicated sport. And I was watching and I was like, this is amazing. I, I recognize these people are doing something that 99.9% .9 of humans are not capable of, but there's so much to learn. And I just kind of watching my dad get excited about it. I was like, I want to know everything about this. And yeah, just spent the rest of my life trying to learn. I think you're wasting intelligence <laughs> on this game. <laughs> You, I can't even, I'm, I'm, you're so ahead of me, I can't even say sum cum laude. We know, we know what you want to say. Sum cum laude of Yale. <laughs> and then you go on to be what you are and make that decision, we'll get into it. Mm -hmm. I want to know, because there was some, some one of them smart little uh, tech nerds one time. They asked him a question like, how, do you, how are you? You're smarter than us. You're smarter than the rest of the world. How'd you get there? And he said, every time I ask my dad a question, he would either tell me the answer or we would go look it up together. And he was like, he put a lot of that into his intelligence and the, his, his problem solving, I guess it was. And he's, now he's a billionaire, one of those, one of those little Zuckerbergs, Zucker whatever the names are. How did you become <laughs> the sum cum laude of Yale? That is crazy. There's only so many of y'all in the world. That's more elite than the NFL, isn't it? 
That's more elite than the NFL. Yeah, numbers wise, it probably it's is. It's probably comparable, I guess. I don't know. I, I haven't looked it up. I always liked school. Not gonna lie, I was a nerd. And I loved reading and loved going to the library when I was a kid. And nobody from my, where I, my family had ever gone to an Ivy League college or anything like that. Um, but my parents, when I was really young, basically made me believe I could. This is the story of a lot of people who've kind of gone on to things at every step of the way. And because they thought I could, I thought maybe I could. And um, yeah, at a certain point when it seemed to be a possibility, I just kind of went after it. The good thing is we know you're not perfect. Only a 1560 on the SAT? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> You, you guys time. really did your research, huh? <laughs> this, is, this is a little embarrassing. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, we know you're not perfect. I saw that video of you dancing earlier. Nah, nah, that's cool. That, that's cool. You know, you know. What they did to her, though, they gave her too many numbers. And because she was trying to, you know, she probably started like like that little that little gear for the, the numbers are floating around the dude's head. She was probably like, well, <laughs> if I go to eight count here and I get to the beat right here, then I'll be more perfect in step. Whereas, you know, us dummies just say, you just gonna feel the rhythm. I actually just don't have rhythm and I can't <laughs> sing. And yeah, so I can't do that. No, but seriously, uh, are there ever moments you feel, you know, overqualified? Because while we were doing that, no, I'm serious, because you're amazing. I think you're amazing. I was telling RC, and I'm just sitting there watching and see how you, you know, your wordplay, your articulation, how you just break things down in a fun, funny way as well. Um, and then doing that research, you know, seeing all these different honors, he said, uh, summa cum loud. I thought he was going to say, some cum loud. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I, I, I was wondering like actually that. if it was going in that direction. <laughs> I got my legs crossed. I'm right. Like, it no, right. but it, 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 <laughs> it, it's so much that, you know, you can do, but you speak about your randomness and just happen to be here. You know, do you set the goals for yourself or are you just kind of just really going with the flow and letting your you know, your, your smarts just carry you the rest of the way. In terms of like going to college, that was a goal. Becoming a writer, that was a goal. Doing what I do now for a living was never a goal. Even though I love football always, um, probably because it didn't even seem to be a possibility. I mean, how do you set a goal of doing something if you've never seen anyone who looks like you doing it, right? It never even occurred to me. And I, I'm not of the mindset where I think of myself like as a pioneer or I'm going to do this. No one's ever done this before. I'm like, oh, they did that? Okay, great. You know, I'll do that. I'm, I'm like a rule follower kind of. So it just never even occurred to me that what I do now would be possible for someone who looked like me. And I really ended up doing it just because of other people suggesting it to me, believing in me, people like Ryan kind of having my back but it was not something I chased at all. But when you have the best in the business tell you how great <laughs> you are, I mean, does it create a, a, a vision of, this is what I wanna go to next? Only like recently have I started thinking that way a little bit, I guess. Um, I am, I've only recently broke out of the mindset, I'm probably still have a bit of, I'm just happy to be here. Yeah. I, I don't, you know, yeah, you guys have probably had that at various points in your life where you're just like, I hope, you know, people know that like, you know, like if I'm, they're gonna find out, you know what I mean? What do they call it? imposter syndrome? Yeah. So for most of my television career and certainly covering the NFL like this, I've just been like, okay, just, you know, don't, don't mess this up. Uh, cause, cause I, I just felt so lucky. I still feel really lucky. You go from, from Yale, you're an investigative reporter, you move over to write for ESPN, the magazine. And the first thing I read from you was the story on Jalen. Oh man. Right, and I, yeah. and, I just thought, and I just thought it was amazing. I believe that was the day I started following you yeah. on social media, all of those things. And I was like, this is just dope. And I started to read it because I was interested in him. Yeah. And then after you start, after I read it, I was interested in you. And then now I start to see you pop up more on TV and you were dynamic, and dynamic in the way, I can be honest, when it started, it was because you don't know what to expect, Yeah. right? In my culture, I come from a place where it's like, you didn't see people like you doing certain things. And it did in some way motivate you, but also intimidate you and say, okay, 
I know people will look at me a certain way because this is unfamiliar. Yeah. Once you got into it and you are, you're starting to move into working with the Dan's and you're working with Marcus, obviously you started off with Lebertard and 70 pages or whatever it was, and you only needed three for, for the radio hit, your first radio opportunity. What are some of the insecurities that you have in, in hoping you could do this job? I mean, I used to be so nervous about fucking up, like, par like paralyzed. Oh, and like some of that is like, because of my identity, I do, like, I do feel like if, if I make a tiny mistake, people are much quick. I felt like that. I'm not saying yeah. it's necessarily true. And, you know, social media is not real. Like, it's not representative of everyone. But I was very anxious about making mistakes. And I was just kind of like, who the hell cares what Mina Kimes thinks about this team? Because when you're a reporter, you're bringing people a story. You know, I'm covering, people read it because they're interested in Jalen Ramsey. Right. When you're an analyst, you kind of are the story, you know? You're the person, you're an expert. And I just always felt like I, you, when you guys come to the being an analyst, you bring instant credibility. I always felt like I had zero credibility. Right. The only thing I could build credibility was by doing it and uh, being on, you know, I guess doing it for a while, but it's not something that I walk into a room with like, I, I walk into a room having, I, I felt like I had to prove myself every single time. I still feel like that. In your approach, the analytical approach, mm. it actually blew up right now. People hired yeah. analytical people on, on, on sports teams, but they are still, and I know it was probably worse when you start, they are still the, I'm an eye test guy, I'll be honest. Yeah, this, that percentage of this to get down to this, hey, they ain't running the ball well to the left side. <laughs> and you'll but, tell but me the, numbers about yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, you should be able to, what I love about our show, and Ryan can speak to this, is, okay, so like I do care a lot about analytics and analytical thinking, and, and I use a lot of statistics. I think there's, you can't just show up and be like, bleep, blarp, bloop, actually yeah. the win probability goes up when they do, you know. Yeah. You gotta show people. And the, the moments that I love making in television are when we marry opinions, tape, and statistics. Like, when you say something like, funny you say that, Yeah. We just did this today. I, yep. I, we were talking about zone blitzing in the Chiefs, and I was like, oh, actually, it turns out like they're extremely good at it. Here's some numbers showing that, and Jalen Hurts kind of struggles against it. And Ryan comes with a tape just like showing how good the Chiefs are at it. Yeah. I think that's great television. Maybe I'm like, I don't know, like high on our supply of <laughs> what we do, but like. It's the, be it's the best football show on TV. But it's isn't okay. that a great feeling, yeah. too? Like, and that's what I, what I want to do, like with numbers. I always want to make people care about them. I don't want to assume just because I have a number or whatever that people care. But that combined with being a woman, yeah. is that it double, like doubly hard for the old guys like me? Because yeah. first they see a smaller frame woman walk in yeah. and then you start telling me why Patrick Mahomes doesn't play well against blitzes from his left side yeah. with zone coverage. Yeah. And it's kind of like, first, I assume you don't know about football, to be honest, you're yeah. fighting that. I'm also Asian, so you can throw that in there too. And, and Asian. So yeah. now you're shocked you didn't say it, like that's the, I think that's a huge part of it. Yeah. So yeah. you have all these not coming in, and then you bring the numbers. Yeah. Is it still, do people, with everybody seeing you daily talk football and know football, and we're sitting around pre show talking football, yeah. and it's not like I'm excluding you from zero coverage talk. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. yeah, you know, we're talking. Yeah. Are you still fighting that battle? You've proven it day after day for years. The number one thing people ask me is what's it like people shitting on you all the time? But I, I, first time I met Steve Smith, he was like, many times, people shit on you a lot, but I like you. <laughs> I was like, thanks, you know? Um, I mean, he was being nice, but like, I think it's because people see on the internet, you know, yeah. in, in, in the reactions are so intense. They're, they're intense, good and bad, because it's different. People are like, whoa, you know? But the reality is the vast majority of people are cool with it now. I, I've found, um, it's kind of just become normalized really quickly. Now, it's not become normalized just because I showed up and was like, wow, dazzling them. It's become normalized because I was just on TV a lot. And, and I cannot stress this enough, I was with people like Ryan. I talked about how I walk in with feeling like I have no credibility. He gives me credibility in the way he reacts to me, supports me, big ups me. And listeners see that, or viewers see that, and they're like, oh, he respects her, <laughs> or he's listening to her, or they're having a conversation. Yeah. 
okay. And, and that's really how I think progress is made in, in this space, frankly. Your game IQ, the ability to be able to break down coverages, offenses. Um, I wanted to, one, ask you, when did that start? Like, how did you develop that? Or who helped you, lead you that way? That's, that's the first part. The second part is um, through analytics and research, statistical mm -hmm. research. And when you watch games, do you watch it, does the stats allow you to watch it from a situational standpoint or do you simply watch it to critique for the job? Those are two really good questions. Um, first one about kind of learning a little bit more about the X's and O's side. You know, it was a lot of friends, um, going back to before I started working at ESPN, honestly, who I just really learned a lot from. I also was like very much on the internet. Like mm -hmm. I used a fan before I was an analyst. And as a fan, I wasn't just a fan like, you know, I'm gonna just kind of read the news on the team. I was like, I wanna read the nerdiest people talking about this team. And I want to understand Oh, we're you now we're running a four three under. Okay, let me like read about like how that has like are these do we have the right body types for that? You know, right. I just like I wanted to yeah. learn right. kind of going back to so it was a lot of that and a lot of like having great friends and, and but I'm still learning. I am not an expert and right. being able to like if I see a cornerback do something I'm confused, being able to text Dominique Foxworth, who's one of my closest friends in the world, is like an insane privilege and right. I learn from the people I work with every day. And then as far as like um, stats and like watching, um, so I don't like start with stats and then watch. I watch, take notes, and then I go to the stats to see okay. if they reflect or they can show me something or can I identify trends over the course of a season. If I'm watching the Chiefs defense and I'm like, oh, they're playing a lot of cover two man in this game, has that been trending up? I might just like go back and look. So it's kind of, it starts with the football and then it goes to the numbers typically. You mentioned like the support at work. And I think in our world, in the NFL live world, it didn't take much. Yeah. You know, like I, I honestly didn't start working with you until a Friday, yeah. which I wasn't even supposed to be on. And we basically were all like, shoot, we don't know who's watching on Friday. We're just going to have a good time. <laughs> that's not a lot of people, by the way. Huh? A lot of people watch on Friday. Yeah, you know, but like, but that's that what it was, like, remember? Damn. We were just like, well, shoot, we're just going to get on here. We're all Casual on Zoom. Let's have, let's have a good time. And, and that's kind of how it started. And we got that support. But I always felt like we became cool first. Yeah. And then now the conversation, it was more so the text messages that people don't see with us just conversing about what we watched and what we thought, or me asking you a numbers question, or you saying, Dan, this quarterback does this, and just kind of going around the room where we felt like the other person was an expert, yeah. and those are how our conversations take place, and then we just mostly dog people the rest <laughs> of the time in the chat. That support is different from the support of the people who have always known you. You know, we've had different people on the show. I've had opportunities to talk to, you know, Nigerians or people who are first generation Americans. And they're like, no, it was lawyer and it was doctor and it was this. Education was always a premium, you know, so on and so forth. Whereas you made education a premium. Like Channing said, you know, you went to Yale, you excelled in that. And he said it in a joking way, but it's like people could look, you're so smart, you've done all this and you want to waste it on football. You want to analyze football with dudes who we don't believe are as smart as you because they played football. Was there a ton of support from the people close to you and a lot of belief in you that you could do this job? There was a lot of support, actually, because I never wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer. I, I always wanted to be a writer, which is, you know, being a football analyst is, a, is way more off the beaten path, but being a writer is not like, you're, you know, not something you do if you want to just like make a lot of money right, <laughs> and yeah. things like that. So I think, and my parents kind of always knew that I would just do what I wanted to do. Um, it's funny because there's like a lot of stereotypes about, you know, Asian mothers. Oh, she must have put so much pressure on you and wanted you to do like be a doctor. And my mom was never like that. I mean, my mom is from North Korea. Mm -hmm. She escaped when she was three. Mm -hmm. Her story is in, like she has already lived like the craziest life you can even imagine. And she just wants me to be, always wanted me to be happy. Right. And so when they were like, whoa, you can do what you, 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 you already spent way too much time 
watching football anyways, that can be your job. They were super supportive. Right. You know, you mentioned your mom and the things she had to go to, go through. You know, Instagram, you know, you posted in 1982, she became a citizen and it's something that you celebrate to now be doing something so American. Yeah. Right? Like it's, we love the sport. We think it's the greatest thing ever because it's like ours. It's, a, it's America's sport, but it's not something that people do all over the, all over the world, yeah. you know? And for your mom to have gone through what she's gone through, to have become a citizen, you know, meeting your father, and how much pride do you take? You mentioned being Asian. Yeah. How much pride do you take in that and being able to navigate this world and also be a representation for a lot of people who can now say, there is somebody that looks like me. I'm so glad you asked that because no one ever really asks me about being in the first Asian American analyst. I, mean, I always get asked about being a woman, but and you know it means a lot to me when young women reach out to me and are like, oh, like, you know, we say, that's cool that you're on TV. But I actually hear a lot from Asian American kids. You know, I said at the beginning, I never thought I could do this job because I never turned around TV and saw anyone to do it. I hear from them all the time being like. I see that South Korean flag you have in your backdrop, you have a South Korean tattoo. And I'm like, damn, maybe I could be an NFL analyst. Like, wow. and that's fine. It's really, it, like it hits, you know? Um, so it means a lot. And I like try to lead with that a lot. So, but I don't really get asked about it a lot. Um, but it's cool. You know what else is cool? There's so many NFL players now who've like embraced their Asian Americanness, mm -hmm. whether it's like Kyler Murray wearing the cream flag on his helmet. Right. Um, Kyle Hamilton, who yeah. we talk about a lot, is very proud of his Korean heritage. That's, I think that's awesome. When did you think about that you're breaking down walls and you're giving hope to, like you say, you keep saying, people that look like me. Yeah. An Asian American woman that can go yeah. on to be mean and kind, and there's kids out there right now running around. Did you think about like breaking down barriers and changing media? Because Neek, I read the article on you, and Neek said there's pre-Mina, yeah, sports TV, and then there's post Mina. He, he's being a lot. Nope. <laughs> but you're the first one, so uh, yeah, you yeah. there is there is there was before Mina and then after. Did you ever think about being? You talking? Hey, you talking about Mina like Christ? It's like it's like B M, which is like bow woman kind of, <laughs> yeah. and A M. <laughs> I don't know if she's Christ. I love you on TV. Yeah, <laughs> but crazy. like through the process, when did it hit yeah. that? I'm I'm affecting a yeah. job, a market this big, multi-billion dollar. I'm really changing the face of this. Man, you know, I, I, I never thought that way. I put a cream flag in my backdrop because it was COVID and I was scrambling just trying to put stuff on top of my shelf. Uh, but then like when people start reaching out to you is when it really hit me or when I'm like walking around on the street and like somebody comes up and it's like a, you know, a Chinese kid who's like, hey man, like, I love that you write for us. Um, that was the only when I like first kind of hit me that it was a thing. And it's like, it's cool. It's a responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, I talked about earlier, I live in constant fear of fucking up. Well, now I'm like, shoot, if I mess this up, maybe that next person won't get a chance. You know, uh, that kind of mentality yeah. that we all bring sometimes. Um, and I try not to think that way because it's not the right way to think, but it definitely is. It, it definitely is something I think about a lot. But that's the fear of fucking up. That's the, um, uh fight or flight mindset, yeah. that greatness is within, like, and you don't even know it. Like, when I, I was so scared to fuck up my rookie year. I I got a muscle spasm in the training room. Just from I, the anxiety? I, I cried like a baby. I thought they were gonna cut me. Oh, <laughs> you're Night yo. the Bro, one, one week in the OTAs, so scared to fuck up, I was always scared to fuck up but that gets me on my shit and it keeps me with this sense of urgency mm. so maybe you know you're doing it without knowing you're doing it i think this is why like if you don't come from a background of maybe privilege or entitlement or just like a sense of belonging you do carry that with you kind of forever because mm -hmm. it's like wow i'm here this is amazing but i could lose it all in any second you know, right. and I, that's, I think, something that is hard to shake. You, uh, you're talking about backgrounds. You, you taught uh, fourth grade and, and once upon a time Badly, in Baltimore. Yeah. Poorly. How was that? I was the worst teacher ever. <laughs> what made you so bad? Because I could not discipline kids. <laughs> I liked like reading and stuff, but I was, I, I was so bad 
at discipline. My class was so wild. I had no control over it. You was in the hood? I, it was in, yeah, like inner city Baltimore. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. And I liked it, but yeah, I just couldn't handle that side of teaching at Anybody all. Anybody say, Miss Kind, I'm going to kick your ass. You know them little <laughs> no, kids they be were, bad. They probably loved her because yeah, she didn't discipline. I know, I know. Some <laughs> I think be I bad. tried too hard to just be their friend, to be honest, yeah. which is an instinct so I sometimes have. One, to be... Extremely intelligent is first the blessing of the gift, and then you have to also nourish the gift, right? If you didn't read the way you did, if you didn't study the way you did, if you didn't place that importance on it, then it wouldn't have been cultivated into who you are. And a lot of times those individuals seem to be very poignant about who they want to be and what they want to do. And you said you wanted to write, but you've also, you know, you've taught and then you move in to TV and there's all these different things that honestly, I mean, you probably, you sucked as a teacher because you couldn't discipline, but I'm sure <laughs> you were able to teach and allow people to learn because that's exactly what you do for me. That's exactly what you now do for everyone who watches the show. In a perfect world for you, talking about like young Mina, right? And young Mina, as, as young Mina saw herself getting to this point, how could you ever have imagined to be this? It would be like 999th on the 1,000 list of 1,000 things I thought I would do. I mean, it just, I don't know. I, you know, some people have that ability to like dream really big. Mm -hmm. It's just never kind of been me. And like I said, it was like such a remote possibility. Um, even now, sometimes when people are like, what do you want to do? I'm like, why? I mean... I love what I do right now. I don't know. It's like a dream. Like I, I think just being able to like work with your friends every day and like talk about like something that you like would do for fun anyways is crazy. When you tweet, right? Like when you tweet before the show, when you tweet, you put all of us on there. Like it's all and it's always yeah. either like a cool picture or a yeah. video or something. Yeah. I get so many tweets on my mentions, Mina marry me, or <laughs> Mina, you're so you're so hot, all of these different things. You don't put yourself out there like that. It's not like, oh, I want you to see that I'm beautiful. <laughs> or even, I want you to see that I'm smart. Or I want you to say I'm amazing. But now when you start to get this attention, not only because of how well you do your job, but people look at that success and they look at that power, look at the way you carry yourself, the way you present, and they start to see all of these other things about you that you they believe are amazing. How do you deal with that and continuing to stay humble, but also I can watch you as I'm asking this question and you're like, yeah, I don't think none of that stuff. I just don't believe any <laughs> of it, to be honest. I just think people say wild shit on the internet. So, I mean, no, I mean, I honestly wish I think is actually a per, like, to kind of go back to what I was talking about earlier when people give me shit, it's just the flip side of that. And the reality is, people who give me shit and the people who are like over the top and praise, they're just kind of saying stuff to say. That, that's how I feel anyways. I don't feel like it's like a, a genuine human interaction. Mm -hmm. And I think like you kind of have to flatten it all and treat it all the same, which is just like people typing, you know? Mm -hmm. We are all kind of like trying to deal with how do I deal with the fact that a million people can say things to me now at all the times. Do I take it seriously? Do I engage? Does it mean anything to me? Yeah. And because there's good and there's bad, I feel like you just have to like kind of minimize all of it and try to limit how much comes into your brain and how much it affects you. Because otherwise you'll just go crazy. Yeah, one of the four agreements is don't take things personal. Yeah. And that's a huge part of it, right? They say whether it's negative or positive, you can't personalize those things because a lot of times those things are projecting what people believe in themselves or the experiences that they've had yeah. or their reality and the things that they see. And so that makes a ton of sense because you don't want those outside noises to change this, yeah. right? Because once that starts to change based on what you hear, you've now lost control of you. And sometimes it's impossible to gain it back. You say change, right? It has to change you. The fame has to change you. Because you're up. I would assume military kids are usually weird and isolated and introverts. <laughs> Am I wrong? No, man. Actually, I would say the opposite is true, just because when you're a military kid, you're kind of a chameleon. And this is maybe why, even though I was um, like a pretty nerdy in high school, like 
in some ways. I always fit in with everyone. Like I fit in with different crowds. This has kind of been my whole life. Been because when you're a kid and you grow up and you move to a different place every year, you gotta fit in. Like I never had good birthday. My birthday's in September. I never had good birthday parties because I was always in a new place. And I always had to make new friends. And I actually think like coming from that background, you just, you carry that with you forever. Like you can just drop me. And maybe this is why I was like a decent reporter. You can just drop me in wherever and I'm like pretty comfortable. And make it happen. I don't know, that's, that's how I, maybe it doesn't come across that way to people, but I genuinely feel pretty comfortable in like most situations. Yeah, and going through that, well, you, you set me straight about military kids. Okay. But going through Respect that. Respect the troops. I got you, you know, <laughs> you know me, you, you, you check me all the time, so I'm good. But going through all that, and then you have this gigantic blow up of fame. Yeah. And I know you're modest and you keep, your humble and we understand that. And like you, you exude humble, but fame changes you in good and bad, it has to. Fame has to change people. The negative side of it kind of got to me a little bit. Um, and it did start to change the way I did television and, and at various points, like people would come and I'm your looks or say you didn't know anything. It would affect me and like reduce my confidence or make me be like, I shouldn't have such a strong opinion or I should talk less or I should look different. So that part of it affected me for a while. And I've had to be like really deliberate about fighting it. I think we all do, honestly. Like humans aren't built for the internet mm -hmm. and for the fact that we are all now getting like, it's like we got like a million bosses following us all the time, giving us like performance reviews. Like nobody's built for that. And I had to learn how to like actually like push that aside. The internet has become like a literal matote. That's like the voices in yeah. your head and the things. Yeah. But it has because there's so much that, that happens that now people get to weigh in on that for years, they didn't have the opportunity no. to. Like you could think to yourself, these people think those things of me, but that didn't mean that it was true. Or that didn't mean you had a an actual visual or an actual person that could touch you with those things. But you actually went on and I think it was Levitard and talked about this and mm -hmm. was emotional about this. What was that experience like to have to kind of live that publicly now? You know, I've talked a little bit about this in the past, the fact that it has like affected me just because I kind of want other people to know I'm like, like we're all dealing with this and we all can have our day ruined by some shit we saw online. But I also have changed a lot of the way I use the internet since then. Like I see less now. I've had to be like very rigorous about all of it because it's just got to protect your mentals, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I didn't put a premium on that earlier in my career. You know that expression, don't take criticism from anyone you wouldn't take advice from? Mm -hmm. There would be days I would leave, I would see something shitty that like, you know, someone with a bird avatar said, just an American flag, you know? And, <laughs> and I'd be like, damn, I sucked. And then Ryan would be like, say something really nice to me. And I would be putting more emphasis on that. That's crazy, but we all do it. It's yeah. like, we don't- Focus on the negative. Yeah. yeah. Once I, this is like a little bit of a humble, I guess it's a brag brag, the story I'm about to tell. I was so upset by something that I saw on the internet one day on a Friday. I went to a party and it was like a dream. I turned around and it was Don Cheadle. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, hey, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm a big fan. I just wanted to shake your hand. I was like, whoa, Don Cheadle, thanks. <laughs> And then he left, and then I was started complaining about the thing I saw earlier. I think, and my husband was like, "What the fuck is wrong with you? Don Cheadle just said he's a big fan, and you're upset about, you know?" And I, it's like hard to keep that perspective. I really try to. Free agency, <clears throat> teams pay a premium for the big dogs. Yes. But they also court them, pretty much give them what they want. Does Lenny get a package? <laughs> I don't know where you're going with that. In your, in your upcoming uh, deal. You know, hook him up you know with like some doggy my... edibles or something? <laughs> <laughs> CBD edibles. Yeah, no, I've tried those. They don't work on my dog. I tried them flying. <laughs> the, the liquid drops. You know, everybody has that friend from high school who like marijuana has the opposite effect on. That's that was Lenny. Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know why Lenny's my podcast host? It was like an inside joke with myself because I was like, wow, who's going to subscribe to a woman 
hosted NFL podcast. I guess I need a man on it. So I put my dog on it, but he can't talk. Yeah, I don't know about Lenny. He's we're a little bit package deal, but yeah. he's pretty he's kind of kind of low maintenance. Mm -hmm. so. My uh, my man Tateo told me to say this. What's the, what they call? Matote. Mama Tote put this in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny you talk about yeah, the football stuff you bring up your husband. Yeah. I just I'm thinking about it because normally I guess it's gender yeah, yeah, assumptions. Yeah. Where you have parties, the men go by the grill and talk yeah. sports. The women go, I don't even know. I'm not over there. I don't know what they talk about, to be honest. Yeah. Where, where are also you at? Because if, if I'm talking defense and you're at the party, I'm saying, hey, Mina, 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 Mina. <laughs> Come over here with the boys. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Where, where, where are you at at the party? I'm, I'm in both places, but I, I, I always grew up with a lot of male friends, I guess, you yeah. know, talking about. And um, yeah, I'm usually just, I, I, I will say, man, we have a lot of female viewers. Yes. They are passionate about the game. And they, I, whenever we put out like content that's like very like really talking ball, it's amazing how many women love it as well. And that's something I'm really proud about with our, proud of with our show. You're into uh, fantasy football? I do fantasy, yeah. I, I'm in a few leagues. So yeah. you build your own team. So that should be perfect for your next gig, like front office. <laughs> You know, teams can use the analytics person, the guru, GM, breaking down numbers, knowing the game. I mean, it should be perfect. Ah, uh, man, if you thought there was backlash to just Saturday. <laughs> 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 well, I am very unqualified for that. And yeah. it is a lot more fun to criticize what teams do than to... <laughs> I do believe the sky's the limit. I think the world Appreciate is you. opening up to two different things. So I'm not necessarily sure I'd say that that isn't going to happen. Um, but you have a Seahawks tattoo. Is it, is it just one? Uh, I just have the Roman numerals. Yeah, yeah. Of, of the Super Bowl. And so that's your squad. Your quarterback is the comeback player of the year. Loved your guys' interview with him, by the way. That was mm. awesome. What a special guy. Thank yeah. you so special much. Special story. But he's a, he's a free agent now. Yeah. No, I mean, and so when you look at your team, we, we thought that they were going to be, since Russ was gone and that was Russ's world, we had no idea was, what was going to happen. And then Geno Smith steps in, he plays the way he plays, and we think to ourselves, okay, Pete might know a little bit more yeah. than, than what we thought, a little bit more about Russell than what we knew, and yeah, a little bit yeah, more for sure. about Gino. When you look at that organization, your yeah. organization, what, what, what do you think happens next with the Seattle Seahawks? It really seems like they're gonna keep Gino, everything coming out, all the whispers you're hearing, the way he's talking about it, the way they talk about him. I think it's absolutely the right decision. Um, for a number of reasons, you know, I, I I have to take time to look at the rookie court, the prospects for the draft. But when the Seahawks dropped to five, I think that made it more likely, you know, because they didn't have that. At one point, they were at two. But I kind of wanted them to stay with Gino, anyways. I mean, we cover the draft, man. How many guys don't hit? Like it's we, Ryan and I were talking about this on the way here. It's so hard to project rookie quarterbacks. Other yeah. positions we have so much more success with. But if you look at the last like five or six years, it is all over the place. And then the bird in hand is a guy who I believe is capable at playing at a top 10 level consistently. He made some of the prettiest throws in yes, the NFL this year. I thought there was a little bit of a decline down the stretch, but I thought a lot of that had to do with the protection and some of the lapses. And I think they can address the blocking a little bit on the interior. To me, like you already see, I, we can get this level of play out of him. I think it'll be a pretty reasonable contract, all things considered. And there's so many holes elsewhere to fill on that team, particularly the defense. Yeah. I would love to see them use their draft picks on building that front It's seven. so crazy. I work with you, right? A lot. You know? <laughs> like too much. I work with you a lot. And there's never a day that I'm, I'm not amazed. Um, some of, the, of my favorite things that you do is when you actually leave the numbers alone. Dan talked about it when you did your tape. It was like, who has a show? And there's so many times that like you bring up like black things, right? Minority <laughs> things. They're just being honest, right? On it's our like, show, yeah. yeah you mean. Right after the, yeah. The, the games and the teams were picked, I was like, okay, I just want to take this time. I'm supposed to be picking the games. So I was like, I want to take this time to talk about Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes, right? Yeah. The first black quarterback matchup. And I want to talk about their fathers, right? And I want to bring attention that to the great. fact that they, they were in the homes and they did support them and they did teach them how to be great leaders. And you know what you get when you do that? Why they got to be black? Well, because they are.
Yeah. Right. And there was a time that they didn't get the opportunities or they weren't thought had the leadership or the mental capacity to play the position. This is why it's historic. So, you know, so you say all those things. I do want to get to a point to where we don't have to point out that you're a woman. Hmm. Right. But I think sometimes it's our conditioning that we've been conditioned that women do go sit over there and have that conversation while men sit over here and have another conversation. But when Dan says, like, what show has a woman that can do that? That's just actually true. Mm. When you start to talk the X's and O's, when you start to talk cover three, cover two, and all those different things, I'm like, she's dead on. Like, she's right. Like, there's so many times, like, if me and you miss a call, we're probably going to talk over one another with the same... Say, oh, my God, you guys don't even know how often this... So we have these, like, calls before our show where we kind of are like, yeah, he's going to hit this side of it. Here's my take on the Ravens or whatever. Or whatever. We're, we're, like, obsessed with the Ravens defense for some reason. <laughs> and literally the proof is just like, Ryan said the same thing. He also wanted to talk about the Ravens simulated pressure versus Cincinnati. And, and then Ryan's always like, she can have it, she can have it. And, but, but it really is kind of crazy. What gave you the confidence, Mina, to move into that? Because someone who has, is as, as intelligent as you are and understands the analytics and can speak about them in the way that you do, they want to stay in that comfortable wheelhouse of, okay, if I, if I stay here, people won't think I'm trying to be a player. But you've yeah. gotten more and more comfortable and are so good at speaking to the X's and O's and what you see on film. What gave you the confidence to move more into that? Getting outside of numbers, whether it's talking about black things, as you said, yeah. or which, by the way, I feel like it's very important for me and not just the black men on our show to talk about those things. It's important for me to not just be this person and only talk about this stuff. And then as far as like the football side of it, yeah, it's, it, it really was just like getting support from you guys whenever I did it, honestly. Whenever I tried to dip my toe or just kind of expand my scope a little bit, having my teammates, having Laura Rutledge, who's the best host on earth, Dan, Marcus, you have my backs, makes me, gives me the confidence to just do it again. You kind of touched on where I wanted to go next. You mm -hmm. just beat me to it, which you do often, especially <laughs> if they call you first uh, for, for the production meeting. But whether it's sexual assault, um, domestic violence, uh, minority coaching yeah. hires, owners misbehaving or treating people in a certain way and not being punished the same as players are, you've always been extremely vocal about those things and not in a, a flippant, disrespectful way, but in a true analytical, fair way, but also that breathes life into a show. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean in making a show exciting that some of these things are bigger than snapping the football. Some of these things are about changing people's lives or about putting people in positions and situations that they can never recover from certain traumas. And you've been vocal about those things. Uh, you haven't been scared to speak about them, but that does come with a backlash. Yeah. And you mentioned you had the thought, do I speak about this? Do I talk about this? What has the journey been like for you at getting to a point to when they call you and I've been on a call with you before where it wasn't a topic mm. and you're like, no, we need to talk about this or this is important or this should be said and you step up in that manner. Instead of thinking about the backlash or thinking about maybe like, I don't know, people I need to impress won't like this or I got, it's better to be safe and neutral. I always, whenever the story comes up like that, I always think about the person who needs to see it talked about. You know, I think about if it's a story about sexual assault or I think about maybe the woman who's turning on ESPN and sees that it's not being talked about or that people talking about don't care. If it's a story about black coaches being passed over yet again, it's felt like only black players, and this is true of the NFL, were talking about it. And I really think it's important for them to turn on TV and say like, oh, it's not like other people care about this. Other people are in, like, want to draw attention to it. Other people have done the work or are noticing these trends or have reported on it. So I just think about that all the time when I try to like think about like, why do I want to talk about any of this stuff at all? Because you're right, it's not always fun yeah. and it doesn't always go well, but um, it just kind of feels like imperative to like represent those people, I guess. Who's your favorite uh, co-host, like co-worker? <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. This is um, an easy one. <laughs> we know that answer. Man, this is like trying to pick a child. <laughs> yeah. 
Come on. They all bring something different to the table. That Can was I take not a the minute? question. He has that a nickname. The <laughs> Very well known. <laughs> Swagoo. Come on, <laughs> Nina. We all know it. I'm going to tell you something that, about all of them that people might not know. Dan Orlovsky has th a, an ability to make fun of himself that is Fair honestly sure. unmatched, and it is what makes him... I mean, so there's a lot good. of things that are special about him, but he doesn't take himself seriously, and it's incredible. Laura Relage, basically, like... You know, she's awesome hosting. You know, people don't know what a host does. She basically, like, produces our show. She's, like, so invested. She cares so much about making it. Like, I've never met anyone who cares more about her work than her is fucking nuts. Um, RC, you know, I mean, he's, like, good at everything. There have been moments where I was, like, doubting myself or insecure. I think you pick me up more than anyone. I have been on TV with you, and even like you, once I was upset, and literally the whole show, every segment, he was like, Mina made a great point. I can't even tell you how, like, that sounds so small, but like, it completely turned my shit around. And he boosts me so much with the football stuff, too. It's unbelievable. Um, Marcus is probably like the most caring person I've ever met in my life. Like, he literally is like, I know he seems that way, so it's like probably not surprising to people. He's just like the warm, he's like a son. Like he like just emits warmth. That's why people, he's probably the most naturally charismatic person I've ever been around. But that warmth is like real and it's not fake and you feel it every time you're around him. So to answer your question, I can't choose. Do you listen to me? It. They're good. all amazing. It's good. I love it. The show is something that we all take pride in. Yeah. Because I go back to at least when it was initially picked, which I wasn't picked for it. But, he loves mentioning and that. I would never I would never not mention that um but it wasn't that Swagoo at the time was the star he is today yeah same with Dan same with you uh Laura was coming from SEC Network and when they decided to put this crew together they put some things together that have not worked they don't get to the point to where they don't feel like it's not going to work but I do believe that putting this crew together based on who they thought would have great chemistry, who they thought could do the job well. I think this is one of the best decisions they've made when you just think of yourself individually though. Because we have these, we have these conversations. We all want to do this together. Like we want to make this the best show that they, that's ever spoken about football. But we are all independent contractors. Mm -hmm. If Mina Kimes is working somewhere else and she's making $5 million a year because she should, you know what I mean? I'm going to be shooting you texts like, yeah, Mina, that was dope. Yeah. Or I don't know about that with Mina, so we could just argue because I'll probably miss it. And you said you haven't really thought that far into the future. But for you, what is the dream job? Like, what is the job that Mina Kimes does that not only satisf satisfies her, but puts her in a place where she feels like she's fully using all of her gifts. It really is kind of looks a lot like we're doing now, just reaching more people. I think football fans are a lot smarter than TV has given them credit for. Mm -hmm. Honestly, like a lot of times over the years when I'd watch football coverage or studio, it was kind of just like cliches and like, it, it hasn't changed that much. And I think fans like, know so much more now than they did like 10, 20 years ago. And I think our show respects them in a way. Like we're gonna have like a very intense conversation about like, you know, various things. And I think that I, the audience can be bigger for that because I really think football fans like are craving like real football talk. And like, you know, I'm, not, I'm not talking about like, you know, the craziest thing about it. I just think like we, it can be a lot smarter than it's been. I think we've, we've grown to be a lot smarter. Yeah. The, the thing that's helped our show is we still have to do the things that rate, obviously. We have to do the things that people tune in to see, but we've gotten so close as a group of colleagues, whether it be not just us, the cast, but also the producers, yeah. where sometimes they let us do what we want to do. Yes. Yeah, right? Yeah, if we yeah. have a conversation that we think is important or a conversation that we think is extremely smart, you know, when we started the, to do the trends and we had the round tables that lasted 10 minutes, we were fine with the last 10 minutes. And then when it blows up, they're like, oh, we can do that again. Yes. That, that worked. And I think you can, we can it. continue to do more of those things. For Mina Kimes, and this is your last question. <laughs> okay. What is your biggest pivot? What moment 
in your life do you remember, whether it was an adverse moment, whether it was some a success that made you feel a certain way, but the moment where you said, okay, I have to take this and grow from it, and this will allow me to be better going forward. You know, it's kind of when I realized that I could be myself on television. I thought I had to be polished. I'm mean, thinking about it, women on TV are polished. I'm not polished, Ryan, you know that. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I was like, I don't really look like everyone on TV and I've seen and I'm doing a job that women don't do or whatever. And so I gotta really like, you know, make sure it's like pretty like polished and buttoned up and I don't fuck up like we've been talking about. And I don't laugh my weird ass laugh and I don't make dumb jokes. And at a certain point, I just got tired of trying to be what I thought a woman on TV was supposed to be. And I just started being myself. The same, you know, the person you talk to offline is, I don't think it's that different from- you Cuss less. <laughs> okay, I guess I cuss less. <laughs> but other than that, it's pretty the same. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Once I realized that is really when stuff started to take off a little bit for me, honestly. Because I think people just kind of want you to be yourself. Yeah. I gotta know any little meaners or meaningettes or meaningettes coming? Minions. Minions? <laughs> uh, you mean like, I out of me or yeah. like in the world? <laughs> out of you. I mean, I'm pretty busy these days, so I don't know about you that. You can make out. You want me to write down how you a make a baby? A mignonette? <laughs> what do you call it? What do you call it? A, a, a flame a mignon? <laughs> in that vein, the world could use more of you. Um, <laughs> you just but, cleaned up his shit but so we much. Are, <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are extremely oh, excited that we have the one. And, and it's been for me, a blessing to work with you, a blessing to know you. And you've helped me grow and inspired me to do things differently. I think, you know, and I told you this, it's pretty easy to me to talk about football. Yeah, it's some, it shows. Yeah, it's something, it's something I've done my entire life, something I've loved my entire life. But when I get on air with you or when we're text messaging and I have a feeling and I'm saying, Mina, what do you think about this? Normally I'm asking, Mina, do the numbers match? You know what I mean? Is, 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 what, I'm, is what I'm seeing uh, correct? And it does, as, as same as you mentioned, you love when we're on air and, and you have something you say, then I have a film for it or a tape for it. I'm the same way when, <laughs> when we're doing the trends That's and cool. I talk about something and then it's, it's, it's time for you to speak and you're like, yeah, the numbers say this and the team that's best at it is this. Right. Because I was like, I knew, that. I knew all that before she said it. No, nah, it feels so, good. And so I, I do want to tell you from, from a friend and from a colleague, like just keep being you. You make us all better, every single one of us. You make everything we do so much smarter but on the other side of it, honestly, you just make it freaking fun. Oh. You know, like that's what Fridays were. Like we might be on a two second delay and we didn't care because we was going to laugh through that two seconds anyway. Yeah. And so for as long as you're a part of NFL Live and I'm a part of NFL Live, the support is going to be the same. But I just truly, truly enjoy working with you. And thank you so much for sitting down with us. I appreciate you a lot. Thanks, yeah. guys. Yeah, that was dope. Did you make <laughs> minionettes, bro? Minionettes, minionettes. What the hell is a minionette? Uh, okay. Can I just say, your teeth look amazing. I just, I just been thinking that, that I didn't, I, I didn't want to, I don't know, maybe I should have, I was just, you were talking and I was thank looking you. at your teeth. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cow, pin in it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach cow, pin in it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission.